Hi, gang. Thanks for joining us for the Agile Leadership Track on day two of spring one. It's my honor to be your MC for the next few hours. Up next are Daryl Dwyer and Nuz Mahmoud from TD Ameritrade talking about measuring ROI and driving adoption of TAS in an enterprise. Take it away, Daryl and Nuz. Welcome everyone. My name is News, and my colleague Daryl and I will spend the next 25 minutes sharing with you what we have learned in our journey to drive adoption of Tanzu application services at TD Ameritrade. We have a lot to cover, so we'll get started first with Daryl introducing himself and sharing some high-level thoughts, and then I'll dive a little deeper into the what, how, and why of the role of metrics in our cloud adoption initiative and I'll share with you some examples of what we measured, how we visualized the data, and what conclusions we drew from it. Hey, thank you, News. I'm Daryl Dwyer, Principal Architect with TD Ameritrade. So when thinking about cloud adoption, we tend to gravitate toward the technical challenges. Depending upon where your firm's at, the journey will differ. If you're a mainframe shop, as an example, the road will be considerably longer and harder than if you're a new startup. We also have a tendency to go into such a program thinking, if I build an awesome platform, they will come. But the truth is it's far more complicated than that. We can't emphasize enough the economics of such initiatives, which can vary tremendously based on a, a multitude of factors, like your IT organization, uh, size and infrastructure, the size, quality, and age of your application portfolio. Your program will likely be under a lot of pressure to demonstrate return on investment given the high cost of such an endeavor. Success isn't guaranteed, which is something I think we all appreciate, but beyond the technical challenges and securing the initial funding for such a program, there are other potential roadblocks and disruptors along the way that can easily derail your program. These might include changes in IT leadership, disengagement, and competing business priorities. So one day your adoption program may be your technology organization's number one priority, but the next it may fall by the wayside if not properly managed. At the inception of a cloud adoption program, it's critical to identify and agree upon a common set of goals or objectives. It's valuable to organize such using a system like Objectives and Key Results, or OKRs, which is what we used at TD Ameritrade. As the program continues, it's necessary to measure your progress against these goals. Ongoing communication of progress and success, in your successes specifically, are critical to ensure continued executive support and IT engagement. So at TD Ameritrade, I led our Cloud Foundry Adoption Program. We worked closely with Pivotal, and we structured our program with four parallel but highly cohesive work streams following a variation of Pivotal's playbook. The first work stream that you see depicted here was tasked with partnering with our delivery teams to adopt the new platform. Through pairing with developers via application transformation or AppTX engagements, we help teams new to Cloud Foundry simplify and accelerate their adoption of the platform. We created educational offerings, we worked to establish best practices, and we helped to build a thriving Cloud Foundry development community. The direct engagement with the product teams also provided an essential feedback loop into our program for feature asks, as well as helping us to gauge the satisfaction of the development community. The second work stream depicted here was focused on improving the onboarding experience in our software delivery pipeline with an emphasis on automation and self-service. If you don't get this part right, many teams will not realize the value of the platform. They may, they, may, they may suffer churn and frustration and you risk community disengagement. The third work stream focused on engineering, operating, and improving the platform. This is really the table stakes. And it goes without saying that if you don't have a robust platform, no rational team is gonna to wanna to use it. The fourth work stream led by my colleague News partnered with our Agile Transformation Office to help advance skills and practices to deliver quality applications to the platform. And more germane to our discussion today was responsible for identifying, measuring, and providing visibility into all of the data and metrics that enabled us to communicate upward and outward on the performance of the program and how we were doing toward achieving the, the objectives that we had set forth. News will give us a deeper dive into that. Thanks, Daryl. 
Um, so with regard to metrics for our Cloud Foundry program, the first thing we had to do was define what's important to measure. One metric that matters, because as the saying goes, what gets measured gets done. I also believe that metrics should drive behavior and it's a better investment when you can use metrics to achieve business results rather than solely use metrics as a reporting capability uh, uh, to management as part of uh, sort of progress reporting. So at TD Ameritrade, we decided that since we were introducing a new technology and we wanted to get a return for our investment, driving adoption would fuel the returns that we were looking for. In other words, the more that we could get software delivery teams to get on the platform, the faster we would realize the benefits of Cloud Foundry. So having decided that adoption was the one metric that mattered for us, then that drove our strategy for um, our approach during the program. Adoption would be more quickly realized if we used a lift and shift approach to getting on the platform rather than spending time to modernize applications to first get them to be cloud ready, cloud friendly, cloud resilient, or cloud native. So once we had uh, arrived at those discussions, and I shared with them uh, them with you in a few seconds, but these were many meetings and many sort of uh, 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 hand wringing as to, okay, where do we go next and how do we decide this? Uh, once we had that settled, we then needed to operationalize our metrics. So we started by creating some definitions and setting goals around enterprise adoption. So were we going to measure adoption by team, by application? Were all teams and all applications equally a candidate for um, getting on Cloud Foundry? Basically, we had to define our pool against which we were going to measure progress. And at TD Ameritrade, we decided that our adoption would not be in terms of teams, it would be by application. So once we came to that conclusion, then we could tackle the next steps. The first challenge was, all right, how do you define an application? What a user sees as an application, as you know, may well be 20 services that are delivering that user experience. So our conclusion was that an application was going to be each discrete deployable that is independently pushed onto Cloud Foundry, excluding utilities. So with that definition in hand, then we could move forward to our operationalizing our metrics collection. Um, however, the next challenge presented itself, which is where do we get this data on each discrete deployable that is being pushed onto Cloud Foundry? So we asked our software delivery teams to contribute to the information using a manual tracking worksheet. Uh, we defined some naming conventions and some metadata around business unit, current environment, and so on. And over time, we pushed for automation on that, but initially in the spirit of starting and then learning from that experience, we felt that a manual approach was best. Having made those decisions, then we moved to visualizing the goal um, so that this could become transparent for all and become that goal that was adopted and embraced across the enterprise. What you see on our screen is, um, remember we were trying to drive a behavior. And so um, we uh, came up with what are the different business units um, that we were going to participate in this and they're represented on the leftmost column with the different colors and um, they all contribute toward the enterprise goal. So for example purposes, if our enterprise goal was 200 for the fiscal year, then there's a teal blue and a light blue and a dark blue and each of those represent different business units that, that all contribute toward aggregating at an enterprise level to 200 apps on platform. And so then the um, second um, and the last uh, bar chart on the right, uh, what you'll see is they represent our progress toward that. So throughout the year, obviously those numbers incremented, we could see who was um, adopting it faster and who wasn't. And that also helped us with some guidance for the other work streams um, that Daryl mentioned, because we could offer lots of support through platform engineering, through technical coaching, through AppTX engagement from those other work streams to help make sure that as many applications as possible got on the platform and eventually into production. 
So what I just shared with you was um, making transparent the, that rapid adoption was the vision we wanted our software delivery teams to embrace. The question was, how do we translate that so that it's meaningful for engagement from executives? While adoption itself was interesting, we felt that what would really drive that engagement from our executives was being able to translate what adoption means in terms of a return on investment. And so instead of uh, defining return as revenue, um, we defined that the return would be from uh, time savings um, from having adopted the platform. And saving that time meant that there was an increase in an opportunity for productivity from the software delivery team. So for that latter objective of being able to translate adoption in terms of return on investment, we then had to collect the data to measure how much time had actually been saved. So um, with help from Tanzu uh, partners and, and in their insights, we created a 65 question template where Cloud Foundry was likely to have impacted our software delivery and operations processes, hopefully in a way that saved time for the software delivery team. And we agreed with our sponsors and stakeholders on what that translation would look like, what the dollar cost was. So for example, purposes I've just put on the slide here that if we had $75 an hour, here's how we would translate that into the, instead of saying cost savings, we called it a cost offset because it wasn't uh, technically a savings of out-of-pocket cost. So it was an out and a cost offset. The 65 questions that we uh, asked uh, in order to figure out where we were actually saving time and how much time fell into four categories. Um, the four are provisioning, planning, development and promotion, and maintenance and expansion. And on the slide, I have details as to what questions fell within each category. Um, I won't necessarily read them all to you, but as an example, provisioning includes load balancer configurations, your firewall configuration, your build server setup, and so on. The planning category includes a variety of meetings that are needed before the effort can actually start. Um, perhaps you might have some review boards, um, some CI setup, et, et, et cetera. And then development and promotion, hopefully that's uh, self-explanatory. And finally, maintenance and expansion, including software upgrades, OS upgrades, and the like. So once we had our 65-point questionnaire, and then the next step was, okay, who do we take it to? So if we have a goal, for example, um, of 200 applications, how many teams are delivering on those 200 applications? Because we need to interview those teams about those applications and their experience regarding um, the, the time spent there. So uh, in order to come up with a plan, we first used a publicly available online calculator. You'll see a screenshot of it on the slide here. And um, we had to decide what is the margin of error, the confidence level, and using um, those inputs, um, this was an easy way for us to come up with our recommended sample size so we didn't have to necessarily interview, let's say, 100 teams about their experience. We interviewed people from a representative sample and um, began our 65 question questionnaire. Um, we completed it on a rolling basis. So as teams got on the platform, we, we had captured their plans. And so we were capturing the before and then the after. Um, and just kept the interviewer consistent so that we wouldn't, if, you know, any interviewer bias might be the same. And then we created some Tableau dashboards to represent what we were seeing. Um, some of the dashboards uh, looked like what I've got on the screen here. So first on the top left corner, it's fairly simple. Um, and it's just an Excel worksheet of what is the theme, the team name, what are the total cost offset hours then, and then how do those translate into dollar savings? And then we visualize that through the bubble chart you'll see on the right-hand side. And that's broken up into what are the different groups. So we have a back office group, we have an institutional group and so on. And then within those business units, um, what category, so provisioning, planning, uh, development and promotion, et cetera. And what you'll see, our conclusion in the bottom left-hand corner, the pie chart shows that it turns out that in the provisioning area was where we had the highest number of hours 
um, saved, so to speak, or the cost offset, um, because being on Cloud Foundry um, allowed us to um, not have to execute a lot of the activities that otherwise had to uh, take place. So note that we were measuring activity, we weren't measuring wait time. So this was um, this was this was definitely a you know savings in terms of now that developers or others weren't engaged in those provisioning activities, they had time to engage in um, delivering other other work that needed to be done. In addition to the charts that I just showed, we also felt that it was important to put in front of our executives um, some summary numbers, um, just you know how many apps are in prod, how many have we measured. On the top right hand corner, you'll see a box called developer efficiency improvement. We took the number of hours saved on the part of developers, so this didn't include ops in this particular calculation, and we divided it in terms of we divided it by the number of hours they would have spent on those activities before getting onto Cloud Foundry, and that percentage gave us an efficiency improvement, uh, which was um, something that we found uh, very exciting for a lot of people that were interested in our program. And I can't share with you exactly the number where we ended up, but whether it was 10, 20, 30, 50, some, whatever your number is, um, I think it becomes something that then you can keep tooling away with and say, okay, how can we possibly, you know, make progress on this? Another aspect of our data visualization was um, to uh, to be able to demonstrate the total OPEX that we were expending in order to put the uh, Cloud Foundry platform uh, and make it available to our team um, compared to this total cost offset. So you'll see at, at, it kind of in the middle of your screen at the end of fiscal year 2020 is when we projected that our cumulative cost offset would um, would increase over the total OPEX, meaning for us and the way we defined it with our sponsors and stakeholders, that was the point at which um, our payback period had been um, had been reached and, and any um, applications that adopted the program or the ones that were on the program and continue to have releases beyond that would continue to provide uh, a return on our investment. Um, you'll see that in the beginning, in the in the left-hand side, 2018 and 2019, the slope of the lines is fairly flat, and that's because that's the pace of adoption and learning and new technology and figuring out um, all of the engineering and infrastructure uh, that, that goes into that. Um, but then over time, that uh, speeds up, and uh, that was a very exciting time for us when we were able to calculate, okay, on a monthly basis, we are getting you know, X number of apps adopted, and uh, then we were able to see that number increment as, especially as we figured out our um, supporting infrastructure and how to provide the right technical coaching um, around cloud adoption. So as we neared the end of our program, we had a, uh, we had some metrics that showed something like what you see on the screen. So again, for example purposes, on the left-hand side, the, that bar chart you'll see, on platform, about 730 apps, and in prod, about 250 apps. So while our goal had been met, um, what we were interested in is it, what we were interested in was why the gap? Why is there so many more applications that are on the platform and far fewer in production? So diving into that aspect gave rise then to the next insight, which was all right, we have a number of handoffs, we have a number of stage gates, we have a number of um, bottlenecks in terms of uh, teams that are maybe overloaded, but that have to serve the enterprise. And so um, this gives rise to then the second phase or second part of our program, which was let's figure out our um, what is the next metric that matters. And so instead of adoption, we now are looking at cycle time and say, okay, um, how can we get from uh, getting on the platform to getting in production as quickly as possible? And what are all of those places that uh, delay us in our path to prod? And we've already started um, on that second uh, aspect 
as well. Hey, thank you, News. So we've spoken now about the importance of collecting data and metrics and creating reporting to measure and gain visibility into the program performance. But behind all of this are important stories of how cloud platform adoption has positively impacted product teams and the users of their applications. We often solicited early adopters, including product owners and developers to share their success stories. Hearing real world experiences, including how teams shortened cycle times, automatically scaled their applications, and how their customers experienced seamless quality releases with blue green deployments, spurred interest with other product teams and their business partners in adopting the platform. This led to exponential platform adoption and furthered the commitment of executive leadership to our program. So as you embark on a cloud adoption program, please remember that solving the technology problems is only one part of the equation and will not on its own ensure the success of a cloud adoption program. A set of common goals, clearly understood metrics, and constant communication to leadership and your stakeholders is every bit as important as solving the technical challenges. News and I will be joining the Q&A session in Zoom immediately after this to answer any questions you may have. Alternatively, you can message us on LinkedIn. And thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, uh, thanks News and Daryl. Uh, if you would like to talk more about with them uh, about this, you can uh, join the Slack channel.